Well, good evening, everyone. So very good to see you tonight. As always, thank you for making time. I know you got a lot going on uh, in your week, and I know that you have a lot of burdens that you're bearing and things that you're dealing with and busy things that demand your attention, but the fact that you are with us online or here in person, uh, we can't tell you how much we appreciate that. I can't tell you how much I appreciate that. We love each and every one of you. I was thinking I should have like had a video to show you, but you can imagine this if you haven't seen a video like this, but some of my favorite videos on the internet are of teenagers trying to figure out technology that they didn't experience. Um, so you, you might have seen things like this where um, teenagers have a Walkman, and if you don't know what a Walkman is, I'm not gonna explain it to you. You can come afterwards, I'll tell you what a Walkman was. But, but they have a Walkman, and they're trying to figure out how to make it work, and they're pushing the play button and the stop button, and they can't figure it out, and then they, they tell them, oh, you actually have to have headphones, and then they plug those in, it still doesn't work, then they have to open it up that concept of even opening up a device that like, doesn't make sense to them whatsoever, and then to stick in this little plastic rectangle with tape inside of it, I mean, all of it just seems so weird and bizarre. They can't make sense of it. All You have to do all of that to, to make it play something. But it, it occurs to me that if you don't know what something is or what it's supposed to do, you have no idea if it's broken or if it's working properly, right? If you don't know what something is, you don't, I don't know what this thing is, I don't know what it's supposed to do, then you have no idea is it working properly or is it broken. We've been talking about, for the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about the brokenness of the world and how we can all acknowledge the world isn't working the way that it should or the way that it's supposed to, but what about the church? Are we working the way we're supposed to? Are we being what we're supposed to be? We've talked about how we need to make sure that we don't allow the world's divisions to become our divisions. And also last week we talked about how we can't allow the world's solutions to be our solutions. But it occurs to me that if we don't know what the church is, or how the church is supposed to work, then we don't know if the church is broken or not. We don't know if what we're doing is what we're supposed to be doing or we're just doing what we think we're supposed to be doing. So I, I want to walk through this concept with you just a little bit as an introduction tonight. Followers of Jesus are part of a global diaspora, a dispersed people group. Even before we get to some of the individual points, let me just kind of stop there for a second. What is a diaspora? Obviously a dispersed people group, but what people groups, so this is the interaction portion of our lesson, but what, 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 are, some, what are some diasporas? What, what are some dispersed people groups? Okay, the Jews, yeah, that may be the first group that comes to your mind. The Jewish people, even in the first century, or long before that even, were a dispersed people group, right? They, they were originally from the land of Israel, but they were spread all over the place because of captivity and exile. And so to this day, they continue to be a diaspora. They continue to be a dispersed people group. What other diasporas are there? Okay, yeah, the American Indians, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the Native Americans are definitely a, a dispersed, at least in this part of the world, a dispersed people group. Okay, yeah, Christians, absolutely, yeah, we'll get to that in just a second, yeah, for sure. Yes, there's an African diaspora, right? Because of the African slave trade, there's an African diaspora. Armenians, another people group that are dispersed. There are lots of different dispersed people groups. Christians have to learn to see ourselves as a diaspora. In fact, that's how books like James and 1 Peter are written. They're written to Christian people who may be living in the city in which they were born, but they have to reimagine themselves as a dispersed people group. That we, and again, we've talked about who is our we, who is our us. Our us, our we, is not necessarily the people who look like us or talk like us or come from the same city, state, country, empire as us. Our we and our us are fellow believers in Jesus. Those who also belong to Jesus. And so our people group is a diaspora spread all over the world, which means several things. Number one, we are to view ourselves as exiles and immigrants in whatever nation we live. 
And that is a, a completely foreign, literally, concept to a lot of us. That we have to reimagine and rethink of ourselves as being exiles, foreigners, sojourners, immigrants in whatever nation we live. We have to think of ourselves as being missionaries there. Yes, we might have been born in a certain place, and we may still live in a certain place, but now, because of Jesus, now we are immigrants, we're exiles, we're foreigners, wherever we live. Number two, wherever we live, our capital city, our homeland, must always be the new Jerusalem where Jesus reigns as the king of heaven and earth. This is the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews is teaching Jewish Christians specifically that their homeland, their capital city, is no longer earthly Jerusalem. It's the heavenly Jerusalem. It's the new Jerusalem. And that continues to be true for all of Jesus' people. So your homeland, your capital city, is not Washington, D.C., or Austin, or Dallas, or anywhere else. Your capital city, your homeland, is the new Jerusalem what the Hebrew writer calls the city that is to come. And we have to think of ourselves as being focused on and belonging to that city. Number three, neither forming our own earthly nation nor taking over an existing nation would be consistent with the mission of our king. Jesus had the opportunity, didn't he? He had the opportunity to take over a nation and to make it his own, but he said, my kingdom is not of this, what? earth or world. My my kingdom is not of this earth. If it were, my disciples would fight. But that's not how his kingdom works. It wasn't the way his kingdom worked in the first century. It's not the way his kingdom works in the 21st century. Because, this is number four, number four, God intends for Christian communities to be planted in every nation to challenge that culture's dominant narratives, lifestyles, and priorities. This is what it is to be salt and light, what it is to be, as Jesus says, leaven that works through the whole lump of dough. God intends for his people to be planted like seeds in every single nation all over the world and to challenge, to be different than, to be countercultural, to challenge the dominant narratives and lifestyles and priorities of every people group. Not to become the dominant ones, but, or, or certainly not to be conformed to the dominant narratives and lifestyles and priorities, but to challenge the dominant narratives and lifestyles and priorities. And finally, number five, we are to pl- proclaim the good news of God's kingdom and extend acceptance within that kingdom to people of every nation, tribe, and language. We'll talk more about that on Sunday when we get back to the book of Revelation. But this is why we always, here at McDermott Road, we're always talking about the fact that our kingdom, the nation to which we belong as Christians, is a multinational kingdom, a multi-ethnic kingdom, a multilingual kingdom. We belong to a global kingdom. We belong to a dispersed people group that belong to Jesus. Our hometown, our homeland, our capital city is the new Jerusalem. And that changes everything, doesn't it? And so if we learn to think of ourselves this way, the way Jesus describes it in all of his kingdom parables, the way James puts it in the book of James, the way that First, or the way Peter puts it in the book of First Peter, the way we, we find all of the apostles and teachers of the first century thinking about being Christians, if we learn to think of ourselves this way, then we see we do have a job to do in this world, don't we? We have a job to do in this world, to be salt and to be light, but this is the way that we do it. We do it as being a nation, a kingdom that belongs to Jesus that is spread all over the world, and we are calling people to be part of that kingdom. That's our goal. That's our mission, is to bring people into the kingdom of God to, as Jesus says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added unto you, right? This is our mission, our goal, is not to pursue the interests of the earthly nations where we happen to find ourselves, Our goal, our mission, is to pursue the interests of our king and his kingdom. And that transcends the things of this earth. It transcends the kingdoms of this world. But see, what ends up happening all too often is that we are conformed to the culture in which we live. 
We are conformed. Rather than being transformed by the renewing of our minds, we are conformed to the culture in which we live, and we become just like the people around us. And Jesus warned about this, didn't he? He said, if salt loses its saltiness, what good is it except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet? Sunday, we talked about the the message that Jesus sent to the church at Laodicea, that they had become like lukewarm water that he wants to spew out of his mouth. That we, when we take on the characteristics of the place in which we find ourselves, we're no longer doing what we were created to do. We were created to challenge, to push back against, to expose the, na- the, the narratives and the priorities and the lifestyles of the world and to present something different an alternative way of living, an alternative way of thinking, an alternative way of behaving. But when we become just like everyone else, Jesus would say things like, if you love only the people that love you, what different is that than than the Gentiles? The Gentiles do that kind of thing. The pagan people do that kind of thing. The people where you live, they do that kind of thing. My followers, my people, they love their enemies and they pray for those who persecute them. They're different, they're holy, and we are called to be that holy and different people for our own sake, but also for the sake of the communities in which we live. So if you have your Bible, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to pick up where we left off last week. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. Here's what Paul says. But I, brothers, could not address you, the church at Corinth, as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. To go back to what we were talking about last week, they hadn't really embraced the message of the cross because the message of the cross that God wins through a cross was foolishness to the world, wasn't it? It it seemed ridiculous that God was going to conquer, that God was going to be victorious through a crucified king. That idea and concept seemed foolish, but Paul says what the world sees as foolish is actually the wisdom and the power of God. For those of us who are being saved, this is the power of God unto salvation. But the church at Corinth was struggling to accept this. Why? Paul says because you're still thinking like fleshly people rather than spiritual people, people that have been transformed by the Spirit of God. You're still like babies. Uh, Not exactly a compliment, is it? You're infants in Christ. You're just like babies. You haven't grown up into this new way of thinking. You're supposed to be a different kind of people. You're not supposed to think like the world thinks and have wisdom like the world has wisdom or have power like the world has power or think of strength like the world thinks of strength. You're supposed to have left those things behind and become something new. But you haven't really become that new thing yet. You haven't allowed the Spirit of God to transform you. You're still thinking in the flesh. You're still being like infants in Christ. He says, verse 2, I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you, you were not ready for it. And even now you're not ready, for you are still of the flesh. While there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? He's saying that's the, way, that's the way the Corinthian society operates. It's, it's not surprising. It shouldn't surprise us when we see jealousy and strife in the world. That's natural, isn't it? It's natural for the world to fight with one another. It's natural for the world to compete with one another, to be jealous of one another, to try to outdo one another, to have a pecking order and to push other people down so that they can make their way up. That, of course, of course that's the way society operates because they're of the flesh. But the diaspora of God, the people of God, the children of God, the spirit-filled people, The kingdom of God is supposed to be different than that. But he says, as long as there's things like jealousy and strife among you, you're salt that's not salty anymore. You're you're not hot or cold water. You're lukewarm water. You're fleshly people. You're, you're, You're acting like babies. You're acting like you were before because you're bringing in all of that stuff from out there. You're allowing them to shape you rather than for you to be a positive impact on them. And how often do we do that? 
how often do we, we just live the way that seems natural? And of course it seems natural. Of course it seems natural to, to form groups and factions and parties and to say, I'm this kind of a person and they're that kind of person and draw a line here and draw a line there and to be jealous of one another and strive with one another and fight with one another and compete with one another and try to outdo one another and step on others so that we make our way up. How often do we keep doing that? And Paul says, as long as you're doing that, you're acting, you're acting like people of this age, of this world, of the flesh and not of the spirit, you are behaving only in a human way. And you say, well, wait a second, Paul. I mean, I am, I am human, right? But by the spirit of God, we're actually supposed to be something more than merely human. We collectively, we individually too as well, but we collectively are supposed to be something more than merely human. So if humanity, if spirit-filled humanity looks the same as fleshly humanity, something is dreadfully wrong. If the people who are supposed to be spirit-filled humanity are behaving just like those who are not spirit-filled, then the spirit-filled people are not walking by the spirit. They're choosing to quench the spirit and walk by the flesh. See, but again, if we don't know, this is what the church is supposed to be. The church is supposed to be this alternative community, this alternative kingdom, this different narrative, this different perspective, these different priorities. Then we say, well, what's the problem? Because we're just doing what everybody else is doing. And Paul would say, if you're doing what everybody else is doing, that is the problem. Because you're behaving in a human way. Verse 4. For when one says, I follow Paul. And another, I follow Apollos. Are you not behaving? Are you not being merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. So they are, again, rallying around these different preachers and teachers, saying, this is my favorite teacher, this is my favorite preacher, I really like how strong he is, I like his use of rhetoric, he's such a great speaker, and they're forming factions following different leaders. And again, as we said last week, if that's wrong to do with spiritual leaders, with Christian leaders, how much worse is it that Christian people would rally around secular leaders that way, worldly leaders that way, to say, I'm of this leader, I'm of that leader, I'm of this group, I'm of that group. And Paul would look at that and say, that's what the world does. That's what the people of the flesh do. That's what people of this age do. But new creation people, spirit-filled people, people of the new Jerusalem don't act that way. And if you're still acting that way, you're acting like babies. You're acting like infants in Christ, like people of the flesh rather than people of the spirit. He says, I planted, verse 6, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. Who is Paul, to go back to our word of the year, loyalty, who is Paul saying to give their loyalty to? To God, right? It's God. God's the one who's giving the growth. Paul is just planting. Apollos is just planting. They're, they're planting and they're watering, but it's God who's giving the growth. Give your loyalty to him. Stop saying, I belong to Paul. Paul's not giving you growth. Stop saying, I belong to Apollos. He's not the one bringing the growth. He's just a servant. Stop saying, stop limiting yourself like that. Stop making yourself their slave, and even himself. Not because, not because Paul's teaching anything wrong or Apollos is teaching anything wrong, but it's not to them that their loyalty should belong. Their loyalty should be to God and to Jesus. In fact, I, I love this quote from N.T. Wright in Paul, and N.T. Wright's, commentary on 1 Corinthians, he says this, there is only one pedestal in the kingdom of God and only one person to be put on it, but it isn't a statue to be put up as a monument in a town square. It's a cross. 
and the Messiah who hung and died on it, on the cross, passed judgment on all human fame, celebrity, popularity, and reputation, that is the message Paul wants above all to get across. This sort of celebrity and fame and population, popularity and reputation chasing and seeking after and attaching yourself to. He says that's the way the world operates. That's the way the flesh thinks. But for, for Christian people to adopt that way of thinking or not be, move beyond that thinking, he would say, when you're, when you're a baby, when you're a baby, of course you did that because you were coming out of that. That's how Corinthian society operated. People would say, I'm of this teacher, I'm of that teacher, I'm of this leader, I'm of that leader. They would draw lines and form factions and form groups and form parties. And Paul would say, of course, you thought that way when you were a baby and you were coming out of that, but it's been long enough now. You shouldn't be babies anymore. You should be growing up. You should be becoming spiritually minded. And spiritually minded people don't do this. This is the way the flesh operates, not the way the spirit operates. Your loyalty belongs to Jesus and to him alone. And his pedestal doesn't look anything like the world's pedestal. His fame doesn't look like the world's fame. His strength doesn't look like the world's strength. His wisdom doesn't look like the world's wisdom. His wisdom, his power, his strength, his fame is on a cross. And if you really want to follow him and belong to him, then you'll take up your cross and follow him and stop putting human beings on pedestals like the world does. Verse 9, he says, For we, the apostles, Paul, Apollos, others, Peter, for we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building According to the grace of God given to me like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. The church doesn't belong to Paul. The church doesn't belong to Peter. The church doesn't belong to Apollos. It doesn't belong to any of these people. It doesn't belong to you. It doesn't belong to me. It belongs to God. This is God's field. This is God's building. He's doing something great. He's doing something amazing. Paul says, yes, I played a part in it. I'm working in it. I'm just a servant, though. Don't give me any credit. Don't follow me. Don't give your loyalty to me. Don't chase after me. Certainly don't form a faction with my name attached to it. You are God's field and God's building. And church, we have to recognize ourselves as part of that. We are part of this global building that God has been building for 2,000 years. And for 2,000 years, different workers and servants, preachers and teachers, and maybe your parents who taught you the gospel have been putting one brick, one stone upon another. And you are one of those stones in this beautiful global building that God is assembling but never forget what you're a part of. And it doesn't belong to you. It belongs to him. And we have to be very careful how we build upon it. Because this is God's field that you're planting in. This is God's field that you're working in. This is God's field that you're a part of. This is God's building that you're building upon. This is God's building that you are a stone in the brickwork of this building. So be very careful because it doesn't belong to you to do with as you please or to ignore as you please or to divide as you please. It belongs to him. He says, verse 11, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold or silver or precious stones or wood or hay or straw, everyone's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. He says everybody is trying to, you know, make the building more beautiful, and some people really are. They're, I mean, they're putting on beautiful things, and they're adding on to it in beautiful ways. And some people are just adding things like straw and, and hay and wood. 
And there's a, a time of testing that's coming, and it will reveal what sort of work is being done. Verse 14, if the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. He says this, verse 16, do you not know that you are God's, what church? You are God's temple, and that God's spirit dwells in you. And here the you is plural. It's, you know I'm going to say it, right? It's all y'all, right? It's all y'all. That Y'all, all of y'all that are the temple of God. And God's spirit dwells in all of y'all. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will, what? Destroy him. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. I mean, cities like Jerusalem, Jerusalem obviously at this time had a temple, but so did cities like Corinth, had temples to their gods. And all of these cities had various temples to various gods, and that was a, a way of proclaiming, this is the God that we serve, and bringing glory and honor to their God. And nobody would imagine desecrating a holy place, a temple, a sacred place. We are a dispersed people. We don't have a city on this earth. Our city is currently hidden in heaven with God. It's where Jesus dwells and Jesus reigns. It is the city to come. It is the new Jerusalem. That's our city. We don't have a city on this earth. We're just pilgrims here. We're just sojourners here. We're just exiles here. We're foreigners. We're immigrants here. That's our city. And so our temple isn't a place that we say, hey, come here, let me show you my city, let me show you my glorious temple. We are the temple. We are the temple. Our love and our unity, our bond to one another, within this multinational, multi-ethnic, multilingual family spread all over the world, our love for the Lord and for one another is the glory and honor of our God. And when we divide, we destroy. When we divide and we fight and we're jealous and we're competing with one another and we form factions, then we are destroying the temple of God. And Paul says, whoever destroys God's temple, God will destroy him because God's temple is holy. And church, we have to recognize that there are eternal consequences for not maintaining the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There are eternal consequences for forming factions and drawing lines and practicing jealousy and anger and bitterness and not forgiving each other and loving each other the way that we've been taught to do by the Spirit in Christ Jesus because when we proclaim to be Christians. What we are saying is we belong to this kingdom, this nation of people spread all over the world, and that collectively we are God's temple and God dwells in us through his spirit. He says, verse 18, let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. Do you see? Your job, my job, our job collectively is to expose and challenge the wisdom of the world. And if we just go along with the wisdom of the world and we're wise in the ways that the world is wise and we're strong in the way that the world is strong and we're powerful in the ways that the world is powerful and we're rich in the ways that the world is rich, then there's nobody left to challenge. There's no salt to preserve and to season there's no light to expose and reveal. It's our job to be foolish in the world's eyes so that we can show them what wisdom really is. For us to be weak in the world's eyes so that we can show them what strength really is. For us to be powerless in the world's eyes so that we can show them what power really is. For us to be poor in the world's eyes so that we can show them what wealth really is. 
This is what it is to live in this upside-down kingdom, to be part of this upside-down kingdom, to be salt and light in this world. And he says, if anybody is getting patted on the back and, oh, you are so wise and you, are so, you have so much understanding and you're so strong, you're so wonderful. If the world thinks that about you, you probably need to become a fool so that you can become wise. He says, verse 19, for the wisdom of this world is folly with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness and again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise that they are futile. See, we, we are people of a different age. We are people of a different world. That's what the Spirit of God is doing in us. At least when we, when we surrender ourselves to, when we yield ourselves to, when we submit ourselves to the Holy Spirit, He is making us people of a different age, of a future age, of the age to come. He's making us people of a different world. He's making us people of the world to come. I mean, it would almost be like, I've used this analogy before, but it would almost be like if you took not just a, a Walkman, but you took like a, I don't know, a, a cell phone, a, a mobile. I, my son gets on to me for saying cell phone or smartphone. He's like, it's just a phone, Dad. I was like, well, in my day, we had other phones, so we had to differentiate. But if you took one of your phones and you took it back 200 years and you gave it to someone 200 years ago, they wouldn't know what to do with that. It wouldn't seem like a smartphone. Nothing would seem smart about it. But then if you taught somebody how to use it, how, how, to, how to know what to do with it, they would be like a time traveler. Even though that's when they were born, you were teaching them to be a person of a different age. They would be a person out of time. And that's what the Spirit is doing in you. The Spirit is teaching you right now how to live in the age to come, how to live in the new Jerusalem. So if the way you're living makes sense to the people around you, it's not the new way of living. It's not the new Jerusalem way of living. It's not the Jesus way of living. It's not the spiritual way of living. If we're living according to Jesus, the world is going to think we're foolish. But according to God's standard of wisdom, it exposes that this age and this world is actually the one that's foolish. So he says this, verse 21, so let no one boast in men. Let no one boast in men. This is what they've been doing, isn't it? I'm of Paul. I'm of Cephas. I'm of Apollos. I'm of this group. I'm of that group. Stop. Because when you do that, you are giving your loyalty to them. When you say, I am of blank, you're saying, I belong to blank. Okay. That person, that faction, that party, that group, they are my master. And Paul says, no more. I'm a servant, just like you, he's saying. Apollos is a servant, just like you. Peter is a servant, just like you. Stop boasting in people. Stop giving your loyalty to people. Stop boasting in men. Let no one boast in men. Not only do you divide the church, but you limit yourself. Look what he says next. He says, for what things are yours? For all things are yours. Why are you limiting yourself to Paul? Why are you limiting yourself to Apollos? Why are you limiting yourself to Cephas? Everything belongs to you in Christ. Everything belongs to you. Stop making yourself belong to them. When you belong to Christ, everything belongs to you. For all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas. He says, you don't belong to them. Paul's saying, you don't belong to me. You don't belong to Apollos. You don't belong to Cephas. They belong to you. If you're a Christian, they belong to you. They're here to serve you. Stop making yourself their slaves. But church, we, we got to remember that too, don't we? Stop boasting in human stuff and human factions because you become their slaves and you're limiting yourself to only what they offer. And spoiler alert, they don't offer very much. And they don't even keep their promises about what they do offer. 
Stop making yourself their slave. Stop saying, I'm of this, I'm of that, I belong to this, I belong to that. All things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours. Do you hear that, church? The world is yours. The future is yours. The present is yours. Life and death are yours. Everything belongs to you if you belong to Jesus. Stop limiting yourself and making yourself a slave of this group or that group or this party or that faction or this whatever. Because all you have at the end of the day is whatever they can give you. But Jesus says, I want to give you everything. I want to give you all things. I want to give you the world. I want to give you the present. I want to give you the future. I want to give you life and death. I want to give you all things. All are yours and you are Christ's. And Christ is God's. That's who you belong to. As Christians, that's where our loyalty lies. I am of Jesus. I belong to Jesus. That's my identity. That's my political position. That's my belonging. That's my group. That's who I'm a part of. That's who you're a part of. And when you belong to Jesus, everything belongs to you. So here, to state it negatively, we could say it this way. When you belong to a faction, you fracture the temple of God and settle for a fraction of what could be yours, right? When you belong to any faction then you fracture the temple of God, the church of God, the people of God, the, the kingdom of God, and you settle for just a fraction of what could be yours. All you get at the end of the day is whatever they offer you. When you become the slave of anyone or anything, then all you get is whatever your master can give you. So to state it positively, when you belong to Jesus, you belong to God, and all things belong to you by his grace. Everything that belongs to Jesus, by right, because of who he is and what he's done, belongs to you as a gift when you belong to Jesus. We have to allow that and that alone to be our identity, who we are, whose we are, and the group to which we belong. We belong to the kingdom of God, and collectively we are the temple of God, and we must be a holy people, a different people, salt and light in this world. Not only does our salvation depend on it, so does theirs. The only hope the world has is for the church to act like the church. Let's pray. Father God, I'm sorry. I repent. I repent for anything that I have done to divide your people. And Father, we come before you with humility, accepting this calling that you have placed upon us, this grace and mercy that you've extended to us, that we might be called your children, that we might be your kingdom, that we might be your temple where your Holy Spirit dwells. And Father, we pray that you help us to yield to your Spirit, to submit to your Spirit, to surrender to your Spirit, to keep our eyes fixed on your Son, Jesus, and to walk by the Spirit and not by the flesh. We pray, Father, that we can be salt and light, that we might receive by grace and through faith all of the gifts that you have to give us that our loyalty might belong exclusively to King Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Thank you, church.